Hi folks, this is Jay. Hope you're okay today. I think this is going to be the last video uh, today on preaching. Um, it's as you can see, I was supposed to go to Liverpool. Can't see it there, but it's been raining, and that's why we've not gone today. So I've just spent my time just talking about preaching and just getting back to um, to preaching. So we talked a lot about inerrancy because I think that's the major one of the major problems today in preaching. And a lot of Christians today, if we if we don't have faith in the Word of God, then uh, we kind of lost it. And uh, so we're going to go. We'll, we'll come back at the end. We'll talk a little bit more of history and preaching, and we'll pull out some historical cameos from this book um, which we'll do later on and um, he writes uh, James E. Rosecup the priority of prayer and expository preaching he says if the preacher is to deliver God's message with power prayer must be preeminent his life and furnish a lifelong environment for the fruit of the spirit galatians 22 23 he says a noble man of god a man of prayer is passionate in pursuing god and his values so we'll look at psalm 42 Psalm 42, verse 1. As the heart panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Verse 2. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? The preacher should be a person who follows Jesus. Um, Galatians chapter 2 verse 22 sorry Galatians 2 20 I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I live in the flesh I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So Paul's at, like sold out for God, he's living for God. Uh, Romans 15.19 Through mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God, so that th from Jerusalem and round about unto Lyconium I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Through mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God. So Paul was dependent on the Spirit of God. So we, we have to live for Christ, we have to be dependent on God. Turn to just about Daniel. Daniel was the human channel God used to restore, re record his prophetic plan for centuries to come. Daniel's preparation for this task revolved about prayer. He made it paramount in receiving God's information about Nebuchadnezzar's dream. He also sought the interpretation by prayer, Daniel 2. Later he meditated on Jeremiah 25, 29 regard 
to the 70 years God had set for Israel to be in Babylon exile, Daniel 9, and he made three requests for his people, the restoration of Jerusalem in Daniel 9.16, the rebuilding of the temple and the return of the people. So Daniel 9.16. And now we'll, we'll go, this is Daniel, the first year of Darius, the son of Azorus, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king of the realm of the Chaldeans, the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of years wherein the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, and that he would accomplish seventy years and the desolations of Jerusalem. And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments, we have sinned and have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled even by departure from thy precepts and from thy judgments neither have we hearkened unto thy servants the prophets which spoke in thy name to our kings our princes and our fathers and to all the people of the land O Lord righteousness belongeth unto thee but unto confusion of faces and at this day to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to all Israel that are near and that are far off, though all the countries whether thou hast driven them, because of their trespasses that they have trespassed against thee. O Lord, to us belong confusion of face to our kings, to our princes, and to our fathers, because we have sinned against thee. To the Lord our God belongeth mercies and loving kindness, though we have rebelled against them. Neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God, to walk in the laws which he set before us by his servants the prophets. Ye, all Israel, have transgressed thy law, even by de departing that they might not obey the voice. Therefore the curse is poured upon us, and the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against him. It goes on in that full chapter of prayer. So, Sorry. Daniel was a man of prayer and prayer is the key to, to preaching. I mean that goes without saying, but Jesus urged his, his disciples to pray as he was moulding them into preachers. Beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest, he said. Matthew 9.38 So preaching needs prayer. It needs prayer. And so be careful of the pitfall of being busy all the time. Of running around being busy. Be careful of distractions. Sometimes you can be too much in study. Too, sometimes you can be too much in reading. Sometimes you can be too much in pastoral visitation. Sometimes you can be too much in being busy with your family. Being busy with other concerns. Especially if you've got children or kids. And if you neglect that prayer time, you're going to be weak. And that's where the devil gets you. If it can get you to be weak in your prayer, it can get you to be weak in your Christian life. So before you preach, there needs to be an ongoing time of prayer through the week. Try and meet with someone once a week and pray. If you're married as a pastor or a preacher, try and have a time of prayer once a day with your wife. Where you can just have at least five minutes just prayer. If you're have a little time of prayer with your children before they go to bed 
Um, but try and infuse your household with prayer. Um, but just be in an attitude of prayer in your study. When you're studying for your sermon, ask the Lord to guide you about the sermon to preach. When you're studying the scriptures, be praying all the time about what scriptures to use and not use. When you put your sermon together, be praying about what to put together, how to put it together. When you come to the Sunday service, get your elders together and pray. Very important. If your elders and your congregation are not praying, you're not going to achieve anything as a pastor. The first thing you need to do as a pastor or a preacher is get your congregation to be praying. Because without that, you're going to be flat as a pancake. You need the prayers of God's people. So encourage them to pray before the service. Encourage them to pray before the preaching. When you... Um, get into the pulpit pray while you're preaching be praying and when you finish your preaching pray pray um, for God to keep you as a preacher you're going to be under attack a lot the devil will trip you up every week if he can every day if he can and you need prayer that you keep solid and strong so you need prayer that you'll be consistent in your walk with God. Prayer that you will be able to deflect the wiles of the devil. Prayer that you will not be pulled down by the devil. The devil will try and pull you down. He'll try and sow division in the church. He'll try and sow division in your ministry. Division in your family. And then when he brings division in, he brings despair. Because if you see division in your family, division in the church division in your ministry you get discouraged and you think why is God letting this happen and, and that's what the devil wants he wants to discourage you and pull you down and then he wants you to fall into sin so you say well there's no point in doing this because God's not with me and then you end up sinning or doing something saying something that you regret so you need prayer you need prayer try and spend every day praying over your faults over your sinful habits that maybe you struggle with and every day bring them to the Lord every day plead with before the Lord and say Lord I have a problem in this area deal with it and ask him to deal with you daily Lord I, I you've called me to this ministry I don't want to fall and make mistakes please deal with these issues in my life and be praying all the time so have prayer regularly in your own private life make it a habit have prayer when in your study when you're studying have prayer in times of when you're preaching have prayer with your spouse have prayer with your family have encourage your congregation to pray immerse everything in prayer without the prayer nothing can be achieved without the prayer you'll be defeated so it's prayer it's prayer 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 um, And God will answer your prayers and God will work through your prayers so make it a life of prayer and just think of the Lord he was a man who had quiet times of prayer and all the great saints he all spent time in prayer I'm getting a bit tired after three hours of talking Prayer is absolutely vital. A biographer says that it's, as much as White valued public worship and prepared diligent for, for it, secret prayer was more important to him. The master's notes of his preaching were discipline, prayer, inner motive, humility before God and men, purity to attain through suffering. The same writer notes that white secret prayer led to public prayer that had a powerful impact on him. One of White's students spoke of the days when every sermon in Free St. Church was a volcano and every opening prayer a revelation. White never grew weary of emphasising the need of prayer and of discipline in the Christian life. 
the need of humility and forever new beginnings. A morning watch was almost as regular as the sunrise for H. A. Ironside, 1876-1951. The expositor meditated in his Bible and prayed for an hour. So that's about prayer. Um, then about godliness. And uh, Richard Baxter says, Take heed to yourselves, lest you live in those sins which you preach against in others, lest you be guilty of that which daily you condemn. Will you make it your work to magnify God? And when you have done, dishonor him as much as others? Will you proclaim Christ's go go governing power, and yet condemn it and rebel yourself? Will you preach the laws, and willfully break them? If sin be evil, why do you live in it? If it be not, why do you dissuade men from it? If it be dangerous, how dare you venture on it? If it be not, why do you tell men so? If God's threatenings be true, why do you not fear them? If they be false, why do you needlessly trouble men with them and put them into such frights without a cause? Do you know the judgment of God, that they who commit such things are worthy of death, and yet will do them? That thou teachest another, teachest not thyself? Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, or be drunk, or covenous, art thou such thyself? Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law, dishonoureth God? What shall the same tongue speak? Evil that speakest against evil. Shall those lips censor, slander, and backbite your neighbour, and cry down these and the like things in others? Take heed to yourself, lest you cry down sin, and yet do not overcome it, lest while you seek to bring it down in others, you bow to it and become its slave yourself. For whom, whom for who, of whom a man is overcome, of the same he is brought into bondage. To whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants are ye to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death, or obedience unto righteousness. O brethren, it is easier to chide at sin than to overcome it. John Flavel, another Puritan, agreed with Baxter. Brethren, it is easier to disclaim against a thousand sins of others than to mortify one sin in ourselves. Spurgeon said, Let the minister take care that his personal character progress in all aspects with his ministry. We have all heard the story of the man who preached so well and lived so badly that when he was in the pulpit, everyone said he ought never to come out again. And when he was out of it, they all declared he never ought to enter it again. From the imitation of such a, a Janus, May the Lord deliver us. May we never be priests of God at the altar and sons of Belial outside the tabernacle door. But on the contrary, may we, Nizanzen says, of Basil, thunder in our doctrine and lightning in our conversation. We do not trust those persons who have two faces, nor will men believe in those whose verbal and practical testimonies are contradictory. True ministers are always ministers. Paul says to Timothy, Therefore, if man cleans, a man cleanses himself, in 2 Timothy 2.21, from these things he will be a vessel of honour, sanctified, useful to the master, preferred for good work. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9.27, I buffet my body and make it my slave, lest possibly after I have preached to others, I myself be disqualified. kind of character of a godly man that we have to be it's a very sobering sobering uh, truths we're to persevere Acts chapter 20 22 24 and now behold bound in spirit I am on my way to Jerusalem not knowing what will happen to me 
whether except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions await me, but I do not consider my life or any account as dear to myself in order that I may finish my course and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify solemn, sol solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. So Paul persevered in the ministry. He was a fighter. 2 Timoth 1 Timothy chapter 6 12 we said fight the good fight of faith take hold of eternal life to which you were called and you made a good confession in the presence of many witnesses Paul was a fighter he persevered he fought he was a man of love he was a man who tried he lived a holy life dedicated to God a man on fire for God but a man who lived a life that was worthy of his calling so we're to be people of prayer, we're to be people of a holy life, and um, we've looked at the Holy Spirit in the first video, and now we're going to look at uh, hermeneutics. Now I want to just say this about hermeneutics. People write volumes and volumes on hermeneutics, that is the theory of interpretation. Throughout the history of the church there has been two schools of thought, the Antioch school and the Alexandrian school. The Antioch school has been the historical grammatical method uh, advocated pe by people like Chrysostom. Basically that's taking the text in its context. Then there's been in the Alexandrian school the more allegorical school. and so therefore how we approach a text how we in interpret a text is important now I would say that not only do you interpret scripture with scripture but I would say also that to I'll just put that there to um, interpret scripture the way scripture interprets right so there are allegorical ways of interpretation if you read Galatians Paul uses the allegorical method okay so in other words the historical grammatical method of getting the Bible in its context is an excellent methodology and I think God blesses and honours that because we're trying to understand what the Bible's teaching and I'm going to talk about that more length now I'm just going to put this book, these books away sorry about this well hermeneutics is a big big issue and a big a big problem um, and so we'll just talk about that for a second so there have been two schools of thought in the history of the church. There is the historical grammatical method, which came from the Antioch period, and then there was the um, allegorical method that came from the Alexandria school. This goes back to the 2nd and 3rd century AD. So there were these two schools of thought in preaching. So what that means is the historical grammatical method you Chrysostom would get the Bible in its context and try to understand what each book said and try to get the plain sense of the word and the allegorical method is to spiritualize it by looking at where Christ is for example in the Old Testament so for example um, if you read uh, Athanasius book on the Psalms uh, uh, sorry not on the Psalms yeah his exposition of the Psalms uh, he's a third century uh, church father and you read his book and he's in the Psalms he's seeing Jesus Christ he's commentating about Christ in, in those books in, in those Psalms so that's kind of an allegorical uh, approach with the, that particular one is more typology 
And so today in the academic world, there are many different hermeneutical tools. There is French philosopher Racour, there is no end of uh, hermeneutics, feminist hermeneutics, neo-colonial hermeneutics, uh, liberal hermeneutics, postmodern hermeneutics. You could go on and on and on and on. And they affect theology and there are theologians using all these different hermeneutical methods. But classically, evangelical Christianity has tended to be the historical grammatical method with a sometimes a bit of the allegorical method. Um, two exponents today are John MacArthur, who uses the historical grammatical method, and Dr. Bob Utley, who's written a book on hermeneutics that you can go and read uh, for free. If you just type in Dr. Bob Utley hermeneutics PDF, it should come up and there's a free book there that you can download. But be warned, it's a very, very good book. Very helpful, but it's for people who want to be preachers and people who want to take Bible study seriously. It will take time to study and digest because he was a professor of hermeneutics. But basically, as a preacher, uh, and there's also some good articles by J. John Mc, uh, J. I. Packer on hermeneutics and philosophy, looking at philosophy philosophical issues about language and how that relates to the Bible and preaching and hermeneutics. But basically, as a preacher, your job is to find out what God is saying. So if you're going to find out what God is saying, just allowing the Holy Spirit to give you a verse and you go and preach on it is not good. Preaching on it is not good enough. You need to find out what the context of the text is. Um, so... If you're studying in the Gospel of John, you need to understand... Uh, if, let's say we're preaching on John chapter 3, verse 16, 3.16. So what I would do in my hermeneutic study is I would read the book. So if I'm expounding John 3.16, I would read the book. So I read the whole book of John, make notes what the whole book's about. Now... Uh, Campbell J. Morgan, when he was preaching on a book and making one sermon, he would read a book 40 times, 40 times before he began to study a detailed passage. Right? I would, I would just read it once, but he would read it 40 times. That was one of the great preachers of the 20th century. Now, once you read the whole book, and it might be a passage in Isaiah or Ezekiel, but you need to find out the, what the whole book's about. Get a bird's eye view, the general to the particular. Get a big view of the book. Ask yourself, what's the genre of the literature? Is it a letter? Is it, um, is it a psalm? Is it, if it's poetry, poetry you interpret differently than a letter. If it's a proverb, you interpret differently than a historical chapter. All right? So you find out the genre of the literature, the structure of the literature. Then you study the chapter, you read the chapter. And then as you read the chapter, you can read read it in uh, uh, four or five different translations. This is what I do. So I'll read four or five different translations and get a feel for that chapter. Then... If I'm preaching on a verse, then I'll get my Greek into linear, and I'll read the um, chapter in the Greek. So I'll look, I'll look at what, the, I'll look at, um, and you can have a Greek into linear with English, and you can read it, and you can see how the chapter's flowing uh, in the Greek, and and the way it would be in the Greek. So you're just getting a feel for how the chapter is. Then what I would do is I take my strong concordance and I note key words within the verse and then I'll look them up. So I'll look the key verses up in the concordance and see where else they're mentioned in the Bible and see what the Bible teaches. Then I will then uh, 
use a study Bible. Mine's John MacArthur Study Bible. And then I'll look at the study notes and look at the references there. Then when I've done that, I'll read commentaries. And I don't just read orthodox commentaries. I'll have Catholic commentaries. I'll have liberal commentaries. Um, and um, the, the best commentaries... The, the commentaries are there to they'll give you valuable information. They'll help you to work out whether your interpretation is correct. And they'll help you understand the verse. And they'll, and they'll help you keep on track. But don't use them slavishly just because a commentator says something it doesn't mean you have to accept it. But commentaries are really helpful. And then after all this I pray and think about things I begin to get a message. A message will begin to unfold and I'll have all these notes and things will, will come to me. Things will speak to me. A message will be forming in my mind and all these bits of information of the verses that I've studied. And Basically what I've tried to do is understand the passage. But as I've understood the passage, then God will give you a message of what he wants to say. Through all the verses that you've looked at, through all the studying that you've done, about what he wants you to say through what you've studied. And it will be based on an interpretation of the passage that you've studied, about what actually that passage is saying. So that's what I would do in my study for a sermon in hermeneutics, right? Now, on the philosophy of hermeneutics, there's debates in all the academic world, on, on all the academic subjects, such as sociology, psychology, history, science, everything. There's a big discourse going on at the moment, and it's been going on for a long time, on hermeneutics, how we interpret information whether our interpretation matches reality all stems back from Kant and beyond Kant and there are words like critical realism and all this stuff that are thrown out with these in issues and, and on a philosophical basis um, basically we we believe there is a God and so God upholds all reality, so it's not an illusion. And God communicated us in language. So language is meant for communication and relationship. So, and language can help us to know the subject, whether it be a human being, and to have a relationship with a human being, and to have a relationship with God. Language cannot fully divulge who God is, but can and does the job of helping us to have a relationship with God. So what that means is, whenever when you hear all the philosophy of hermeneutics and everything like that, don't get don't don't be worried about it. At the end of the day, God's given us language for a purpose, and it's able to do the job in helping us to have a relationship with God because that's what we're made in His image. Language can, can do that. It can't fully help us to know God because God is infinite and we're not. But language is adequate for the task in helping us to have an, a real knowledge, a real knowledge of God. That we can be, that language does m uh, mediate reality, whether it be language talking about God or language talk about physical things language is able to do that because reality is real and language is not a language game but is a mirror of that reality it might not be a perfect mirror it might not be that we can come to know reality in its perfectness but we can know reality and we can know God because God is a God of language. God, for, for Number one, God is real. That means reality is real. And language is given so that we can engage in relationship with God and with each other. And because of that philosophical base, when we go to the text, we can be assured that we can gain knowledge of God because it's based on reality when we're using language. 
Whereas if you read um, the academic world, they're in a mess because they've got not they've not got this basis of a belief in a real God and then a belief that reality is real. Reality is not there and God's not there. So all they have is language. And langu what is language doing if there's no reality and no God? What is language doing? Well, language just becomes a, a word game. And so what you have is in uh, the linguist Saussure, um, in the 1915, who lectured at Manchester University, lectured on the signified and the signifier, and it was a uh, basically he was saying that language basically is shaped by the interpreter, and there is no reality. There's just language that language shapes whatever you want reality to be, and so that kind of philosophy of language then comes and used by Heidegger, the great. Uh, German philosopher, uh, where he's talking about the design and about language and about how human beings can, um, we can know that human beings are human beings because they are actually in action, but when he's talking about action and design, language is just a language game. There's no reality behind the personhood of a human being in the critical flow of a Heidegger. And that goes for Derrida, who did, who talked about the tripping of the text, and um, it all comes down to the fact in Derrida there is no reality behind language. The only reality we have is the language game, and the games that language plays in tripping each other, tripping the language trip. Uh, it's kind of like an existential mysticism where, as you play with language. And language interacts with each other, then we might get a uh, a dysfunction or a displacement of a meaning which produces a new meaning, and then the game continually goes on with Derrida. And so, in the end, it it's only a game. And so we have language in theology where we have Tillich uh, or Tillichke in his systematic theology where he writes a systematic theology. And it's just a language game. We have Karl Rayner, the the uh, Catholic theologian. Uh, Tillich uh, was um, a Protestant theologian, but a liberal theologian. And he uses theological language, but theological language is not based in reality. There is no reality. There is no God. It's just a language game. And it's the same with Karl Rayner and many of the theologians in the modern times. They're using language and talking theological language. But if they've not got that ontological base of, re of a real God, they've not got the ontological base of a reality. So basically, it's just a language game. We as Christians believe there's a real God, believe reality is real, and language can get us in touch with that reality. Maybe not perfectly, but it does the task. Because we're made in the image of God, and that's why language was given. So when you're getting up as a preacher, basically, bottom line, is don't be intimidated by Her uh, Derrida. Don't be intimidated by Suzuki. Don't be intimidated by Raku. Don't be intimidated by all these philosophies of hermeneutics. Just get in your word, in the Bible, and preach it. Get the Bible in context and just preach it. Because from a philosophical point of view, the academic world ain't got nothing on you, bro. So preach it. All right? If you want to look at hermeneutics and the history of hermene hermeneutics, have a look at uh, Cornelius Van Til. It looks an interesting book. Um, if you uh, download PDF, if you go to uh, Presuppositional Apologetics 101, um, and you go there and Presuppositional Apologetics 101, and you download Herme uh, a a book about hermeneutics. It'll have the title hermeneutics, Protestant hermeneutics or something. Um, or it might be something to do about the reformed pastor or something. And there is a long history of the debate on hermeneutics. And that's re that will really help you. With probably what I've just said, you'll be able to take what I've said and take that book. And that will give you a, some help in taking on this very complex philosophical debate about language and hermeneutics.
But basically, we go for the historical grammatical method and try to understand the text the way it is. Dr. Bob Huntley's book on hermeneutics will help you. That will just uh, help you. Go on, uh, type in Adolf Schlatter, and there's a wonderful essay that you can read about his about called Method. Uh, just type in Adolf Schlatter PDF and see what comes up. There's an there's a uh, an essay there about method. He's talking about historical method, but there's some helpful information in there about being a pastor scholar and uh, hermeneutics. So, so that that so basically, I've I've given you the way I would do a sermon her, hermeneutically. We've looked at the philosophy of hermeneutics, why we don't have to fear the academic world with their ideas about interpreting text. They're just going to be in a world of make-believe with their epistemologies on theories of language. So just leave them to it. You just be confident that what you're doing is the right thing. All right, and Just get on with it and, and get in the Word of God and expound it. Don't be, don't get bogged down with all the philosophy of hermeneutics that that have got down. People have got bogged down with. Um, it's important. It might seem a bit uh, theoretical, but in the 1970s, the Anglicans had a big debate at Kiel, and uh, J.I. Packer was there, um, Reformed theologian, and John Stott was there. And at Kiel, uh, it was a major. It was in the 70s, it was a major discussion about how the church should go forward. And a lot of the discussion was about hermeneutics. A lot of the priests and pastors discussed about hermeneutics. So it was a big problem in the 70s, and it's still a big problem now for preachers. If you want to read about what the culture is saying, the academics are saying, it's a, it's a, preachers can feel intimidated at the complexity of all that's going on in the academic world with it. You don't need to be intimidated by it. There's nothing to be intimidated. Basically, it's just language games. They're in the land of Nod. Leave them to it. You just get on preach the Word of God. That's what people need. All right? Get on with it. Um, so, yeah. So, you've got articles on the philosophy of language in um, J.R. Packer's four volume work on the word have a look there if you want to know about preaching and hermeneutics you've got a book on hermeneutics for Christians and preachers by Dr. Bob Huntley PDF on the historical grammatical method you can google the history of hermeneutics in the early church and have a read of the Antioch school and the Alexandrian school fascinating stuff and then you can google Adolf Schlatter and there are some lectures by Yarbrough at Covenant, New, at Covenant Theological Seminary which I think will be a help to you as a pastor um, about how to be a pastor scholar and do hermeneutics in a biblical way uh, and um, Adolf Schlatter uh, hermeneutics will really help you uh, to keep on right track, all right. And look at how it's done, how hermeneutics is practiced, the historical grammatical method with John MacArthur. Go to his website and see how he preaches, and see how he expounds the text, and look at the way he expounds the text, uh, and that's the historical grammatical method. Another example is um, Vernon McGee. Uh, he's an expositor preacher. Just go and have a look at what he says through the Bible, look at how he expands the Bible. Uh, those are two helpful models. Um, so commentaries, um, when you're doing hermeneutics, uh, what commentaries should you use? What what commentaries? Um, oh, and then have a read of Van Til on hermeneutics. Go and type in uh, apologetics presupposition uh, presuppositional apologetics 101 type in there and then uh, see if you can find a PDF free PDF on uh, Van Til's book uh, on hermeneutics yeah sorry about this
Okay. Um, so commentaries. What commentaries should you use as a preacher? Right. Commentaries you should use as a preacher. I think, to be honest, I think you have to find... You have to find really what suits you in one sense. Um, what I mean is some some commentaries can be technical, some, some commentaries can be not as technical, some can have more material than in others. And so therefore, you know, everybody's different. Uh, every pastor, every preacher is going to have a different kind of mindset in terms of what is helpful for them one commentator can be a help to one person and it's not a help to another okay having said that there are some classic commentaries that you do well to consult to make sure you're not going off on track and to help you understand the text so i'm going to give you my rundown of some commentaries that I've used in the past that I found helpful and then I'm going to put you on to commentaries that might be a help to you okay and my style and my way of doing it is not necessarily the same as any everybody else so I would say that um, sorry the horse just in the background there I would say um, as a starting point I, I would have two at uh, side by side I would have I would have um, Adam Clark's commentary he's a he's a Methodist and he's a bit quirky Spurgeon mentions how good he is uh, but Adam Clark is really helpful for um, helpful notes. He's very good at Hebrew and stuff like that, and very helpful in giving you footnotes. So Adam Clark is a very helpful commentary uh, Methodist writer, and it's uh, quite a few volumes. You can get them on the computer. You just have a look around, and then. I would say John Calvin. So a set of John Calvin and a set of Adam Clark are a start, are a real help. Study Bible, I would say John MacArthur's Study Bible. I use John MacArthur's Study Bible. He's getting a lot of attack at the moment because he's had a bit. Of, he's bashed the the. Um, the charismatics and uh, he's getting a bit of bashing from um, those who were into Israel and stuff like that but I think his um, study Bible is second to none and the Geneva study Bible is helpful so Adam Clark and John Calvin uh, to start with and Geneva study Bible by R.C. Sproul and uh, John MacArthur Study Bible are two good places to start. They're like little commentaries, really. Um, and basically, if you're a if you're a seasoned pastor, a seasoned preacher, you you you'll have all the main commentaries, and you'll know about all the main commentaries. But Presumably you're a young preacher and you, you want advice about what to pre what what to use. So I would say R.C. Spru Spruill's uh, Geneva Study Bible, John MacArthur's uh, Study Bible, a set of John Calvin, a set of Clark and Adam Clark. You can get Adam Clark and Calvin 
online for free. So that, that goes without saying. Uh, New Testament, and I, I think it, I haven't used him as much in the Old Testament, but I think um, Albert Barnes, um, a 19th century commentator, his commentaries are really, really helpful. I mean, he had some different views on Romans 7 and Romans 5, which in his day was a bit of a controversy. But apart from that, he is a very good commentator. Very, very good commentator. And you can get Albert Barnes um, on PDF for free online. Um, but very, very good. Not like really scholarly, but very, very, very excellent. So I would say Albert Barnes on the New Testament, and you can get him on the Old Testament. I would also say on the four Gospels, uh, J.C. Ryle has written four excellent Gospel, excellent uh, commentaries. The IVP commentary series, um, I've done a set on the Old Testament and New Testament, and I've redone them recently. Uh, I wouldn't agree with all the scholars, and may, some of the scholars um, are not as sound as I would like. But they're a good starting place, uh, and they're very helpful, uh, and they've got a lot of good material that can be helpful for you. But I would use it with use the IVB commentary series, especially the new one, with a bit of discernment. So the four commentaries on the Gospels by J. C. Ryle, you can get them by Banner of Truth, are very helpful, and also William Barclay on the New Testament is a, is an absolute wonderful resource. He's a liberal, I don't agree with his liberalism, no time for it whatsoever. But his Old Testament works, uh, sorry, his New Testament works, a second to none in the Greek. But he'll say things where some supernatural things that happen, he'll, he'll explain away, so you've got to be careful. But as when it comes to Greek and helping you to understand Greek is very, very helpful. And and to understand the classical times, what was happening in in the culture of the time was very, very helpful. Um, Alexander McLaren is very good on the Old and New Testament. Um, Alexander McLaren. Um, a guy called Scott at the 17th century wrote a commentary series. Matthew Henry is very helpful, uh, very devotional as well. Um, Fassett and Brown and Poole are two. Uh, Fassett and Brown are, are, are good in giving you some details. Um, but I, I don't get much out of them myself, but a lot of people do. So Facet and Brown, that's... That's... Uh, that's this commentary. So it's uh, Jameson, Facet and Brown. Uh, what else is there? Keel and De on the Old Testament and Lenski on the New Testament. More professional pastors who are more into the Greek and, and, and Hebrew use them. Uh, that's that's De Leach. Keel and De Leach on the Old Testament. Um, that's on Hebrew. Those those are a must if you want to be really uh, a bit scholarly and know what you know the background to the Hebrew and stuff like that. So that's uh, Keel and Delich. That's on the Old Testament. And uh, and that's Lenski. 
and Lutheran on the New Testament. These are heavy duty Greek texts. I don't use them that in much unless I'm stuck on something. Uh, these are quite good. I got I, I got a set of these. There's quite a lot of volumes of these. Uh, this is a very good set. In fact, if you can't afford the Calvin, if you can't afford Clark, or any of the others I've said, if you could get one set, this would be a good set to get. It's the Preacher's Homiletic Commentary on it, on all the commentaries of the Bible. Sets of the Bible. Preacher's Homiletic Commentary and loads of notes for sermons there. Loads of notes and gives you really helpful information on each text. But it's more... Uh, helps you to have sermon material uh, what other commentaries I have some uh, oh the John MacArthur Bible commentary is helpful um, is a helpful commentary yeah I have liberal commentaries myself there's the IVP new New Bible commentary. It's not as sound as John MacArthur. It's very helpful. Um, so I have liberal ones. I have liberal scholarship and Catholic scholarship in my library on commentaries. This is the Jerome Bible commentary. Um, because I, I like, I, if I preach in, I always like to know different views from what I believe, so that if people ask me questions after the service, I know what I can answer them. So this is a liberal commentary, Peter's commentary, which I don't recommend, but I'm just saying I have Catholic and liberal stuff in there, so I, I can check what this, what they said. In terms of a Bible translation, um, to work from, to preach from, I would say uh, a literal Bible. So, I would say really the New American Standard Version or the King James Version, preach from them, really, because they're the best literal. I know the argument is people don't understand them as much, but... Um, try and pick a, a liberal, a, a literal translation, and not uh, a loose translation. Because I, I'm very concerned, as I've been looking into textual criticism, about issues concerning that. That, but that's another story. I've done a lot of videos on that. The the point is that try and get a lit more literal translation when you're preaching, and try and get your congregation into a more literal translation. So have a look round, see what's about, and um, get a literal translation. A Bible that is based not on the West Cotton Hawk Greek text, but is more on what the text of the, the King James was based on. Um, I, I know that some of you are going to say, oh, Jay, you're over the top. Oh, Jay, you, you, you've lost it there. No, I've not lost it. I've, I, I've been doing a lot of research on it. And I'm absolutely convinced that we took a wrong turn in, in this textual criticism. I know it can be a bit law work uh, and all that. I don't want to get bogged down with it. I don't want you to get bogged down with it. But it, get hold of a literal translation and preach from a literal translation. The King James Version is the best version that you could preach off. Or try and find a version that is similar to it but in a modern translation. And there are some about the New American Standard Version is, I think, one. Um, what else? Uh, so, uh, commentary, excuse me. Study here. So, you need 
the concordance of your preaching. So I use this Strong's Concordance. And also you need um, you need background information if you're studying. So I have a, a number of encyclopedias. I have two volumes of this the Marshall and Pickering Encyclopedia so that's there that's, that's the two volume there yeah and down there you see there see there see there it's four volumes of the Baker Encyclopedia right so a good encyclopedia uh, Nave's, Nave's topical uh, Vincent's word studies is helpful for Greek uh, Kittle's word studies where's Vincent 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 got it yeah I found these very very helpful there's four volumes of these Vincent word studies very very helpful on studying the Greek and understanding the Bible when you're doing a sermon and uh, for old and old Old Testament and New Testament studies. Vine's dictionary is brilliant for the Greek and Hebrew. So I would say uh, I, I I use a lot of the Banner of Truth commentaries. Uh, I use a lot of modern commentaries, uh, but I like to read. The old commentaries, but uh, I'll show you uh, some new commentaries. See if I can find it. I'll just show you what kind of work a preacher would do. Uh, so I'll just show you what a preacher would do in a second so you'll learn I, I put you on I put you on to a couple of the classic ones uh, but then you have to grow in discernment yourself <coughs> um, so I I, I I look at a a lot of banner truth <coughs> I use a lot of banner truth <coughs> commentaries uh, this is one on Psalms. This is my favourite commentary of all. I just love this plumber commentary, and I, I like his commentary on Romans. Um, so yeah, <coughs> I adore plumber. I just think he's amazing. But uh, just to give you some idea of of what a preacher would do. Um, so. If, if you remember I told you that I'd studied the Bible yeah, uh, say preaching on John 3.16 what I would do is I'd look at the whole book um, then I'd look at the chapter try and read the Greek into linear or Hebrew into linear if it's, but if it's the New Testament John Greek into linear <coughs> I'd read four or five translations of the chapter <coughs> so I have I have here so I have here <coughs> four translations of the Bible, parallel Bible. So it's got the Living Bible, King James, Revised Standard. So there's four translations there. So I check the chapter, John chapter 3, four or five times. Just read it and try and read it in the Greek or Hebrew, with a, a Hebrew interlinear or Greek interlinear. If it's New Testament, Greek interlinear. <coughs> Excuse me. Then, when I've done that, I would then do word study with my Strong's Concordance and my Vincent Dictionary. So, yeah? 
and that's what I would do there. After I've done that, this is how I do it, I would then read commentaries. Now let's imagine I was doing a sermon on Galatians. So for myself I would read classical and modern commentaries. I, I, I prefer the classical ones myself. But uh, if I was reading Galatians, for example, there's Moses Silver. So if I was doing a series through Romans or some book, I would make sure I get the best commentaries I can get. I'd have about five, six commentaries as I'm working through a book. So I'd, I'd, if I was working through Galatians, I'd have five or six commentaries. So I've got five or six here. So, so like uh, interpreting Galatians, I've got Moses Silver. That's very advanced work on Galatians. It's very, very advanced. Right? And a world authority uh, on Paul's theology, Herman N. Ridderboss on Galatians. And then another famous scholar, F.F. F. Bruce on Galatians. So I'd read these commentaries, and I'd read Calvin and Clark, and read the Catholic, read uh, the Liberals. Read, read William Barclay, read whatever I can get else on it. Uh, read Ellicott, uh, Alexander McLaren. I, I give myself about eight or nine hours of research. So I've got eight or nine hours of reading to do before I start to put my sermon together. And, eight and, and about five or six of those hours would be reading commentaries. A couple of hours will be on word studies. And, and I just read in the chapter in different translations. So it'd be eight or nine, maybe ten hours at the most, doing the research for a sermon, background material, reading different commentaries, right? And I would, I would read classical commentaries, but I would read any of the modern commentaries that have come out recently. I would find out who they are. And I go to the library or I go to a seminary library, there are a couple near me. And I'll go down there, I'll make some notes. I'll dig out classical commentaries maybe that I haven't got. And I'll do as much reading as I can um, around that passage. And that's hermeneutics. When I've got all the information together... I then put the material together that'll be in the next video so we're going to do another video and we're going to talk about how you put the sermon together and other issues about preaching so that's a lot about hermeneutics and interpretation and stuff like that so and commentaries and all the rest so I hope that's been an encouragement to you and a blessing